Good morning, Covenant Community Church. We invite you to stand as we get ready to worship this morning.
continue with worshiping. tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes, steal the joy of you When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm Our sister-in-law, my sister-in-law, was evacuated for four days because of the lava fire. And when they finally got to go home, there was her first sunflower. Up from the ashes, hope arises. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this Independence Day to worship you in our words, music, and hearts. We are so thankful for this nation, for all the sacrifices others have made to build and defend this country. We are grateful. Thank you for the opportunities and freedoms we have in the United States of America. Help us, Lord, to never take these blessings for granted. 
It has been a challenging week in many ways. Wildfires in our home state, buildings collapsed in Florida, with many still missing, and unrest in many places. We ask you to be with those hurting and struggling, comfort the grieving, and give them peace that you do have them in the palm of your hands. We ask you to be with Rodney as he shares his message. May the words he speaks touch our hearts and minds with peace that you are with us each and every day. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Kids may now go to Kidstown. In church, as we prepare to go back into worship today, um, we want to introduce a new song. And it's called Good and Gracious King, and it's one that um, the youth and I, as well as youth leaders, got a chance to hear at Heat Lake uh, last week. And so we wanted to share this song with you. And before we go into that, we wanted to introduce some of the lyrics um, and the importance of just remembering to think about what we're singing as we worship our King. And so this song is called Good and Gracious King. And it stems from um, a verse, Hebrews 4, 16, which reads, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. And some of the words, the first verse reads something very similar, saying, I approach the throne of glory. Nothing in my hands I bring but the promise of acceptance of a good and gracious king. So we're going to bring up the words to the chorus there. And as I read through them, just feel them on your heart and, and think about what we're singing this morning as we worship our good and gracious king. So the chorus reads, You deserve the greater glory. Overcome, I lift my voice. To the king in need of nothing, empty-handed I rejoice. You deserve the greater glory. Overcome with joy, I sing. By your love, I am accepted. You're a good and gracious king. So we're gonna sing that chorus once through. You deserve a greater glory. Overcome, I lift my voice. To the king in need of nothing. handed I rejoice you deserve the greater glory overcome the joy I sing by your love I am accepted you're a good and gracious king and as we sing this song Church, we invite you to sit or stand as you feel that. I approach the throne of glory. Nothing in my hands I bring. But the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious King. I will give to you my burden. I will give to you my burden. As you give to me your strength. Come and fill me with your spirit. As I sing to you this praise. And you deserve the greater glory. And you deserve the greater glory. King in need of nothing, empty handed I rejoice, and you deserve the greater glory, overcome the joy I
Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this wonderful day of independence here, God, and this day in your house, Lord. And we just thank you for being such a good, good Father, a good and gracious Father, God. We're so thankful for your mercy. And we ask today that as we prepare to listen to the message that Pastor Rodney has prepared for us, that you just lay your hands on his heart, God, and you speak through him, speak your truth through him, God, and open our hearts and open our minds to be able to receive that truth, God. We love you so very much, and we're so thankful for your son and for the cross. We say all these things in your son's precious name. So, you know, one of my very first times I experienced uh, being a leader or being in a leadership position that I can remember happened back to me in the sixth grade, back in sixth grade, right? And so in sixth grade, you know, you're kind of like the, for elementary school, we were the, the top dogs of the school, right? So we kind of knew the ropes of the school. I had been there since kindergarten and I was now in sixth grade, so we knew the ropes. I was kind of the, the king of the school, right? But most importantly, for sixth grade, I had a chance to be on the safety patrol, right? <laughs> and so this, this, this thing called the safety patrol was, was kind of like the prize for the sixth graders, all right? And so this was no small feat, right, to get on the safety patrol, right? For the safety patrol, you had to have all your ducks in a row. You had to be, you know, you had to be legit. You had to be really a good student. You had to, to have your good grades. You had to be really a uh, student because the teachers selected you. And so there was uh, four of us. I think that there's an alternate, right? But we won't count the alternate. There was four of us, <laughs> right, that were selected to be on the safety patrol. And so if you were chosen again, that means you, uh, you got respect. You got respect from the teachers. And, and you're able to leave class early, like 15 minutes before class. 15 minutes, we had to leave and get set up, right? And so it wasn't one of those things to where normally in class, you know, there's one person who starts putting stuff away about a couple minutes before, and then two people do it, and then pretty soon the whole class is like shuffling, and then the teacher gets mad at you, and the teacher says, the bell doesn't dismiss you, I dismiss you, right? Anybody <laughs> relate to that, right? And so, <laughs> and so um, <laughs> that happens, right? So I didn't have to listen to any of that because I was already out of there 15 minutes early because I was part of the safety patrol, right? And so uh, we went there, and we, we went down to, this, uh, to our safety patrol room, which I think, looking back, was like a large closet, like a large storage closet, right? So we went to the safety patrol room, we got dressed, and we, we had, uh, I think, a vest, uh, a sash, uh, a badge, and I, I think we had a helmet. I, I can't remember. Like, I don't know why they would give us a helmet. Why do you need a helmet? For but anyway, we, we had that. So we got up in our gear, and then um, we had these stop signs. You had these long poles, and on top of it was a stop sign. And so we would take it and we would like put it on our shoulders and we'd march out two by two, you know, march out there and everybody's looking at us and saying, that's a city patrol out there. Yeah, you know. And so we're marching out there in the city patrol gear and we had this and, and so we marched out, you know, information and the way uh, we were broken down, you had one, you had two people who were kind of the sign holders. And so as traffic is going, you know, in different directions, the sign holders held the sign and they held out the stop sign to stop the traffic. You know, what power, right? right? Just as a sixth grader, you know, just to stop, you know, <laughs> just, and, you know the, the stop people, right? And so we, we, had, we had that. Then we had somebody who was um, a holder for the kids. And so they would have their hands like this, and as the kids went across the street, the holder would sit there, you know, and just get back, stay, stay back, right? You go when I say you go, right? And so you had that power. But my favorite position, my favorite thing was the whistle guy. Right. Yeah, the whistle guy, yeah. So I was going to cross the street, right? And when it was my turn to blow the whistle, what you did was on your command, 
on your command, those guys put stop signs out or they brought them back in. And so that was just a, a great thing that I like to do. And so, you know, with me, you know, I, I kind of sometimes joked around, you know. And I would, um, you know, blow the whistle, you blow up one time, tweet, and they would put the sign out. And then two tweets, you know, tweet, tweet, and they bring the sign back in. Well, sometimes I thought I was being funny, you know, and I would blow the whistle slowly for to bring the signs back in. I would just do a little tweet, tweet, you know, and the kid, oh, God, Rodney, come on, you know. And then some, some of them got so used to it that they, they hear the first whistle blow and they just kind of bring it up, you know. And I say, wait for my second command, you know, and I remember this one time as I'm blowing the whistle, I'm looking at traffic going back and forth and and, um, you know, one way is clear. So I looked the other way, and I said, okay, one car needs to pass, and they're clear. And I blew the whistle, and I turned my head, and I see this car zooming through the intersection. And I'm like, what happened? And apparently, you know, when I checked, it was clear, and I went back to look this way. I looked a little bit too long in this other direction, and another car had came. And when I blew the whistle, you know, the person holding the sign, I remember it was, it was a girl. I don't forget, don't forget her name. I can't remember her name. But she could have either stepped out and got hit or just let the car go through. And so wisely, you know, she had the car go through because we had people holding the kids back. And I remember the look she gave me. Uh, it wasn't a frown or anything. It was like a half smile like, Rodney, Rodney. Kind of like saying like, you messed up, Rodney. You know that, right? Like, you know you messed up, right? And so looking back at that, I the only thing I have to say about that experience, it was, it was a good experience. I had fun and everything else. But... Who gives sixth graders that kind of responsibility? <laughs> Who does that, right? Does that happen nowadays still, too? <laughs> I don't think so. I think they have adults that are doing that stuff now. Like, who gives sixth graders that kind of responsibility? And the wild thing is, you know, the more time I spent in uh, youth and children's ministry, the more I realized that's a crazy idea to have <laughs> sixth graders out there <laughs> doing that kind of stuff, right? Uh, but I, I kind of tell this story just to kind of have uh, a little light start to a discussion. Um, on leadership as we look at Nehemiah, because bear with me, um, because uh, there's a few thoughts in here that are going to be serious, kind of towards the middle. Um, but besides that, I always enjoy like uh, some, a good laugh and a good time as we learn about God's word. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much just for who you are and just for what you've done for us, God. We thank you that we have uh, a day like today where we can celebrate um, all the things you've done for us and our, our country, Lord. And so with that, we give you the praise and the thanks, and we ask that you Grant us a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to read uh, from Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Um, and again, my name is Rodney Owens, and uh, I am always happy to be here. I love you guys. And um, before we go into the reading, I kind of want to summarize, um, as we read chapter 2, I want to kind of summarize chapter 1 and kind of give you an idea um, to give some context as we go into chapter 2. Uh, this guy, Nehemiah, he served King Artaxerxes as a cupbearer in the Persian city of Susa. And in chapter 1, he's inquiring about the Jewish people, his people, um, who survived the Babylonian exile. Um, Because some time ago, Jerusalem was conquered and parts of the population was exiled. And so Nehemiah, upon asking it, learned that those who survived the exile were in bad shape. The city was in need of repair. Specifically, the walls and the gates, uh, which protected them from their enemies. So when Nehemiah heard this, that the city was in bad shape, he fasted and he prayed. Uh, I can just imagine as you hear about your hometown, the people you love, the place where you were brought up, um, with it being in distress, that it would kind of weigh heavily on you. And so that's what Nehemiah felt. And so he heard this, uh, it says in chapter 1, in the month of Kislev, which is about November, December, in the regular uh, calendar for our calendar. And we'll read in chapter 2 that the events in chapter 2 happen in uh, the month of Nisan, which is March, April. And so there's just, as a mental note, keep in mind that there's like a three or four month delay between chapter one and chapter two. And we're not exactly sure why the delay, but my guess is that Nehemiah had to take some time to kind of figure out what to do and how God would answer his prayer. And so as we, uh, let's go in and read his word. Um, Nehemiah chapter two, verses one through five. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th, century, 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. 
But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. So as I mentioned, there's a delay between chapter 1 and chapter 2, and it kind of lets us know that Nehemiah didn't kind of rush into this, right? I mean, he prayed, and he waited for an opportunity that would allow him to act on this knowledge that he had. And God does that sometimes, right? It's not, it's not always immediate. It's not always something that happens right away. But the call to leadership, in my opinion, will happen to you eventually. But as everything, it's with God's timing. And, and for Nehemiah, it came at an opportune time because he was with the king, and because of his job, the king and Nehemiah knew each other very well. And so at that moment, when he's talking to the king and he asked that he wants to go and rebuild the city, Nehemiah suddenly became God's leader. Now, Nehemiah, as uh, a leader chosen by God, um, you know, uh, decided to do this and rebuild the walls. And I want to encourage you guys to read the first chap seven chapters of Nehemiah to kind of get the entire story. Um, but for today, I decided just to give a, a quick overview um, of the story of Nehemiah, but I want to see what Nehemiah's life example can teach us and how it can be used to help us become God's leader as well. And so first, as I mentioned, he was with the king due to his job, and his job was the king's cupbearer. Now, this was a job, believe it or not, if you did very well and you did your job, you die, right? <laughs> because you're sitting there and you're tasting everything just in case uh, somebody tries to assassinate the king. So you're sitting there, and you have time to talk because the king's watching you and looking at you, and you're eating food, and you're kind of staring at each other, and the king's probably asking, like, hey, how you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> and so they probably made small talk between, you know, between those times of seeing you know, what, the, uh, <laughs> what the answer would be. Um, but this particular time with the wine, the king saw that Nehemiah was very sad that there was something wrong with Nehemiah. And so we asked Nehemiah, what's all this sadness about? And it's interesting because in verse 2 it says real quick, I was very much afraid. And I think that's interesting because I think a lot of times some, we think about leaders, about them not being scared, about not, them not having fear. And I think it's good to be confident in your talents, confident in your abilities, and especially if you recognize that those are from God. But I think it's natural to have some type of fear as a leader or, or somebody um, who is doing something for God. You know, otherwise it wouldn't be brave. But, you know, I think about sometimes, you know, when uh, I had a conversation with somebody before years ago, and they kind of asked about, you know, speaking in front of people, because for a lot of people that's a, lot of, that's a big fear. And they kind of asked me, they said, do you ever get nervous? And I said, well, I said, I think there's, the better word is anxious. There's an anxiousness to it because you're doing something important. You're doing something that you feel God's calling you to do, and there's a big responsibility. And so, you know, there's a point where I think I had a professor who told me, if you get to the point where you're doing something like that, and you're just kind of dead inside and just kind of, eh, then you're probably not in the right position for leadership or in the right job for the leadership position that God is calling you for. But in this situation, the king asked Nehemiah, what do you want? And he says real quick, it says right there in the scriptures that he prayed right away. He prayed before answering. And I don't know if it was a quick prayer or if he took a pause or a beat or a moment, but he, he, he prayed that. And after the prayer, he tells the king that he wants to go to Jerusalem and help his people. So the king grants Nehemiah the wish, and he says, you can go ahead and go and take care of Jerusalem. And in that moment, we kind of see here that Nehemiah has kind of a heart for his people, and he has a great sense of patriotism for his homeland. He decides to step up and be a leader appointed by God, and he feels that he's doing what God is calling him to do. And he goes to Jerusalem, and he accomplishes a lot of tasks that are at hand. I mean, his accomplishments include being instrumental in the rebuilding and the reestablishment of Jerusalem in the 5th century B.C., following the Babylonian exile. And one of the ways he did this was he convinced the people he convinced the people that were living there that the repopulation of the city and the rebuilding of its walls was hugely necessary. And while doing this, Nehemiah encountered hostility from the enemies and non-Jewish local officials in neighboring districts. But in spite of all of that, 
and 52 days, the Jews under his direction succeeded in rebuilding the Jerusalem walls. And again, that's a Cliff Notes version of it. So once again, please read the first seven chapters when you have time. But as for our time here today, I really want to look at Nehemiah's life and how I can speak into ours and how we can be used as a leader for God. And I think being described as God's leader, um, first off, um, I want to clarify what I mean by God's leader. I'm simply saying that God chooses us to do his will and to carry out his work here on earth. We belong to God and we are leaders, so we are God's leaders. And as God's leader, we will all respond to a call. You know, one of the greatest misconceptions I think that we have in our churches today and in our faith and our Christian faith is that only Christians are called. I mean, only pastors are called. I mean, we kind of get it backwards, right? Like, being called doesn't mean being a pastor. We kind of make those things mean the same thing. Being a pastor means that you were called to a specific task by God. Because God calls us to be leaders in the area where we're gifted in, gifted by him. And it doesn't even have to be in ministry. I mean, look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Nehemiah was a layman. A, 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 he wasn't a priest like Ezra. He, he wasn't a prophet like Malachi. He served the Persian king in a secular position before leading a group of Jews to Jerusalem in order to rebuild the city walls. He was in a ministry position. See, God's people all have a call. You must hear the call and respond to it. See, Nehemiah listened. He heard the call and responded as he went to Jerusalem to meet a need that was there. And, you know, responding to a call and being a leader of non-ministry position years ago, when I was in Sacramento, attending the church in Sacramento, I was brand new to the church, going to discipleship class, um, there was a lawyer who was there. And this lawyer uh, loved talking about Christ, right? But his job was a lawyer. And so he would talk to people, and he would say um, to us, he would say, hey, you know what? My goal is to reach one million people, to talk to one million people about Christ. And immediately I'm sitting there and I'm thinking in my head, like, man, that's, that's a good goal, but you're not going to, I mean, one million. Like, you know, think of something more, a little bit more realistic, I, I guess, you know. And then with, without missing the beat, and I'm thinking this in my head, he says, yeah, a lot of people say that you'll never reach that many people. But you know what I tell them? I bet I reach more than you. And at that moment, I said, wow, that's a, that's a good statement. And that guy's a leader called by God. God's leader also knows prayer is essential to know God's will. God comes to us wherever we are. And I mentioned that last week when we talked about Elijah. But we have to be receptive. We have to be able to be receptive to his voice. Nehemiah heard the news and immediately gave it to God, right? He prayed. We see this in chapter 1 and chapter 2, that he prayed to God, what do I do? My people are in distress. Give me an answer. Because prayer sometimes, prayer sometimes becomes that thing we do, right? Sometimes it's something that we do to complete a task or check off a box. We do it in our church services, which is great. We do it sometimes before eating. We do it when someone's sick. We take prayer requests for meetings and gatherings. Maybe we do it before bed or in the morning. But the key is to really put your faith into it. To really put your faith into your prayers. The hardest thing to do, I think, is to pray for something and let it go. To pray for something and let God just take care of it and let God just handle it. I think that's one of the, the hardest things to do. Because that means that you're not going to worry about it. You're not going to stress about it. No feeling sad about it not trying to solve it by yourself, that you're just giving it to God and waiting for God to give you an answer to tell you what to do. For me, and one of, one of the times that was a very difficult time of me praying and, not, and then not turning out the way I wanted it to turn out and having to wait for God to kind of give an answer uh, a year later was the time when uh, some of you guys know the story that me and my... Uh, Wife uh, had two miscarriages one year after another. And the first one was immediate. The first one was right away. But the second one took some time. And I remember we had, went, I, we had just saw the ultrasound. And we saw RJ. That was his name, RJ. And we saw him kicking, you know, on video on the ultrasound. And so I remember, uh, you know, the wife goes to an appointment and 
get a little message saying that, oh, well, I have to stay here a little, a little longer. They got to look a little deeper. There wasn't a heartbeat. And I remember immediately right there, I stopped everything I was doing, and I got on my knees and I prayed. And it was probably one of the hardest times I prayed. Probably one of the longest times I prayed and prayed and prayed. And tried my best. Okay, I'm giving it to God. Everything's going to be all right, right? Give it to God. But it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. But you fast forward, and you kind of see that God had an answer as we're blessed with Riley. And so the question becomes, how do we pray and just let it go? How do we pray and just let it go? And it's one of those leadership traits that may take time. It may take years. It may take a lot of experiences in order for you to do that. But I think it happens because eventually as you strive to know God, you and God will eventually sync up, right? You'll get to know God. Um, working on prayer is just like working on any type of communication between people, right? Uh, between spouses, between boss and, and, and employee, between uh, siblings, whatever it may be. It takes time. It takes work. Our prayer life improves the more we work on it. Because now I'm at a time in my life where I know what to pray for and what not to pray for. I know how to listen for God and discern what he's asking of me and telling me to do. And no, it's not perfect yet for me. It's still a struggle sometimes. It's still a struggle to discern and understand what God is saying. But the more work we put into it, the better and easier it gets. You see, one thing that's evident is Nehemiah had a heart for his people. That's why he prayed so hard. And that is what was at the heart of his prayers, the people. You see, Nehemiah understands it's about people. And God's vision is simple a lot of times. It's very simple. And it will always involve people. It will always be about people. And sometimes we make things complicated, right? God tends to be very simple in his plan, and we make things complicated. I mean, Nehemiah's vision can be summed up in three words. Three word assignments. Rebuild the city. Rebuild the wall. Rebuild the gates. You see, Nehemiah assembled a team of people to make the vision happen. Nehemiah thought in terms of we and us. If you read that, he's using that, those term, that terminology, we and us. Chapter 3 even has a list of people who worked on the project. See, the real purpose of the vision, to rebuild the wall. But the wall was not the important part of the vision. The wall was a means to a larger purpose. When Nehemiah and his people were really about reclaiming their identity as a people of faith. And that's what Nehemiah wanted to do, was have their people reclaim their identity in Christ as people of faith. And so I'm going to take a few moments right now, and I kind of want to emphasize what I just said about identifying as people of faith. And as I said before, I always just come here and I always throw stuff out because I want people to, to try to make you think, right? I want to try to get your wheels turning and, and maybe think differently uh, than you have before. And, and, and I don't try to come here and just, you know, poke the bear or, or, or bring people to anger or sadness or anything else. But I feel it's good to see perspective, different views, and different ideals. And to say that, so bear with me for a moment. Because as we sit here on Independence Day and celebrate the independence of this country, I want to say, as I said a few weeks ago, when I talked about Paul, that God is above everything else. God is above everything else. God is just not the God of America. In fact, we're not even the chosen people in the Bible, right? But I do believe that the church needs to be visible and active in this country as we, when I say we, I mean the church, continue to bring people to Christ. And to do this, we need to put God above our nationalism, our politics, above our laws, because we sometimes place those things over people or sometimes we make them more important than people. For example, you know, we in the church sometimes get worked up, maybe a little bit, over laws, politics. And, and to start out, I'm, I, what I'm saying is I think you need to vote your morals, vote your consciences. I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's what we need to do. Um, we're all different. We have different views, and that's okay, as long as Christ is ahead of us and Christ is first. And I throw the question out there because I ask people all the time, like, is, if you're breaking the American laws, if you're breaking our laws, is it a sin? And that's a rhetorical question. Kind of answer that for yourself. But one thing that I noticed that I feel is very important is to remember it's about people first. And we don't need a politician in office. We don't need a political party in control or a law to affect us to a point where it becomes more important than people. 
and, and kind of like an example is years ago, um, and bear with me here. Years ago, I'll bring it back together in, in a minute. Years ago, we, we had some ugly uh, segregation laws in this country, right? That would have made it illegal for me to fellowship with many of you guys here today that I love. Um, even Napa had a law in the books where it was illegal for me to spend the night. Um, of course, they can't enforce that anymore, but that was in the books in the town of Napa where I got my ministry start. And a lot of pastors that I know back then who were pastoring back then kind of admitted that they wish they would have done more in those times instead of standing by. And some of the reasons why they stood by were they said, well, it's the law. Uh, it's the way things are. It's just the way things happen, the way things are, are these days. Um, they didn't want to get the church involved in, in the political scene. Um, but you had this law here uh, that a lot of Christians were obeying that they didn't agree with. And I'm sure some did agree, but a lot of them didn't agree with. But it was clearly a law that was immoral. So if someone, like the African-American pastors, broke that law, would they be committing a sin is the question. And then I think about today, and I think about one of the hottest controversial laws out there, abortion, right? And this is one that Christians fight about, and it's always highly debated, and there are strong feelings on the issue. And I'm going to make a point in a second. This is one that you can ask yourself, in obeying this law or doing what the law allows you to do, is it a sin? See, on the one hand, you had a law of segregation that was immoral, but it was legal, that Christians followed. Now, on the other hand, we have a law, abortion, that is legal, that Christians don't want to follow. And the point I want to make is we don't need a law as Christians to tell us how to live as God's people. Ultimately, we want to be God's leaders. In both cases, when we get worked up, arguing and fight over the law, and again, there's nothing wrong if you're, moral, if you're sticking to your morals and your consciousness, conscious, but when we do this, we miss an opportunity on the real thing that God wants us to focus on, the people, the people. In both cases, the most important thing is the people. When segregation was happening, it was about the people affected by it and the people that were treated badly. Back then, if you were a Christian and you were, fight, you were fighting for equality, you would have broken the law simply by focusing on people. But you would be being moral by following God's standard. Now, on the other hand, if somebody wants to get an abortion, which, by the way, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but they're probably somebody who maybe they're scared. Maybe they have issues. Maybe they have low self-worth. Maybe there's something going on with them that we may not know if we don't find out, if we don't take the time to find out and have a conversation with them and find out what's going on with them and introduce them to Christ so that Christ has a chance to change them because Christ is the one that changes people. See, we are called to meet people where they are and to tell them about God, to bring them to Christ. Christ is the one that changes people. Nehemiah understood this. Because the truth is, God's vision will always involve people. And it will always be about people. See, I believe when the church gets this right and truly understands this, just as Nehemiah did, we can do some great things. Leading up today, to today, I saw so many pastors and other leaders talk about, you know, this thing about not making the service a patriotic service today. And they're talking about their own churches and churches all around America. And I find it interesting because I do believe there's one extreme. There's one extreme where, you know, you're preaching uh, about politics and you're preaching about political people and positions. But there seems to be something happening on the other end where we're talking about, uh, you know, not talking about the great country that we're in. You know, I've been to Africa and different countries. And trust me, we are blessed here. This country isn't perfect. But we are blessed with some liberties and freedoms here. And I don't think we should be ashamed of them. We shouldn't be ashamed to thank God for them. Because I have no problem standing up here on stage, on a pulpit, or before everyone saying that this country is a country that believes in God. And the church exists to bring people to Christ. And we are proud and not ashamed to say that we are going to continue the great work of Christ uh, to make this one nation under God. And we are going to do that by changing the hearts and the mind of the people. And when you do that... When we declare that, one last thing is God's leader is not discouraged by adversity. 
See, as Nehemiah and his people rebuilt the walls and the gate, they were ridiculed, they were mocked. Opponents were disturbed when Nehemiah was doing something positive. You always have people that will come along, you know, the term they use, haters, that will come along and if you're doing something positive, if you're doing something for God, they're going to come along and say things about you and try to discourage you. Nehemiah even waited three days before he inspected the wall. He wanted to do it when nobody was looking. His enemies tried to discourage them from rebuilding the wall. They threatened to tell untrue stories about Nehemiah as well. And so as we look at that and see all the adversity, as you step up and be God's leaders, that's something that we'll probably face as well. But God is with us. I usually end always by giving next steps, things that you can do to take the next steps in order uh, to apply uh, what I just said in the message. But today, I really can't do that. You are all called to be God's leaders. You are called to be part of the change that can happen in our nation. You are called to be a leader that puts people first. See, the church is ready to move and be that beacon of hope for those who don't have hope. So take some time. Kind of write down your own next steps. What is God calling you to do? How is God calling you to step up and be God's leader? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much just for being a God who blesses us here in this nation so much, God. We are thankful for that. We are thankful that you are a God that will always be with us and guide us and direct us, Lord. Lord, we are, as a church, are called to together bring people to Christ in this nation, God. And we will do that by spreading your word. Lord, I pray that somebody is out there who may have felt that they can't be used by you. I want to pray for them and encourage them and let them know that, yes, you are calling them. They can be used by you. There may be somebody out there who's been hurt by the church, who feels that the church isn't for them. And I want to pray that there is somebody, a Christian, a leader that goes by and just tells them, no, that's not true. No matter where you are, what you've done, and what you're going through, come. Come to Jesus. Come to Christ. Come to the church. So, Lord, with that, we just give you the thanks and the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy 245th birthday, America. <laughs> Pursuit of happiness. I believe it to be one of man's finest documents. Yet one freedom is missing. Jesus told the Jews who believed him, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. As we approach the Lord's table today, let's be grateful for our country where we live today and our Lord with who we live forever. If you're watching us at home, this would be a good time to get the elements of communion together. And if you're here with us, I hope you all have gotten elements as you've come into the sanctuary. If you aren't familiar with our little communion cups, you'll see that there's a transparent lid. Carefully place that back, pull that back a little bit, and you'll have the uh, access to a wafer. And then peel back very carefully so you don't spill it. <laughs> the second lid, which may be tricky, and that has the and that has 
the juice. And now I would invite you to come back with me to that special night in Jerusalem where Christ celebrated the Passover with his disciples. And Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take our bread. In the same way, after dinner, he took the cup. Saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Take and drink. And the Apostle Paul adds, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God bless us all. and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow
Morning, church. Uh, my name is Jason Marcus. I have the uh, privilege, in addition to making lots of noise on the drums, I serve as your clerk of session and uh, lots of other stuff. Um, some quick announcements uh, before we let you on with your day and your barbecues and all the other fun Fourth of July stuff. So, Vacation Bible School VBS starts in just one week. We are so excited. If you have young ones, either in your own family or your neighbors or friends that want to go, tomorrow is the last day to register so we know who's coming and we have everything in order. You can go to the church website. You can talk to the staff on your way out if you have questions. Uh, there might be a QR code if you know what that is in your bulletin you can scan. And uh, we'll take you to the website where you can register, but we would encourage you, and it's open to everyone, not just people in our church, but our entire community. Uh, we are so excited that we can actually have in-person VBS this year, and uh, Becky and her team are working really hard. They're going to transform this place over the next week to get it ready. We're super excited about that. Now, I'm going to switch gears and change hats uh, and put on my pastor nominating committee hat. I also serve on our PNC, uh, along with uh, eight other wonderful people from your church. Uh, and I wanted to give you an update on where we're at, because it's been a little bit since we chatted. So, um, the, as we told you last time the, with the update, the position has been posted. It's now live on a number of websites, both the EPC website, our, our uh, presbytery, but also we've posted it on some other seminaries and other places to try to cast a wide net. We have been receiving lots and lots of applications. We're very excited about that. We have been uh, actively engaged in interviews and are moving through the process. Um, I still have no idea how long it's going to take because the process is ultimately led by God and his timing, but we're uh, excited and thankful that we have people that are responding to uh, the position and uh, we are excited about the pastors that we're meeting and going through the process. And as soon as we have some other updates, we will let you know. But uh, we're very excited to be progressing forward. Uh, finally, as we come to the end of our service here today, uh, this is our time of giving back. Um, uh, you know, God gives us uh, so much. And as you heard Rodney talk about here in this country, we are blessed abundantly. Even those of us that feel like we have little compared to so many in the world, we, we are rich. Uh, and uh, God says that uh, to much is given, uh, he asks just a little in return, and he uses what we give, our time, our talents, and our treasures uh, for his ministry, both within this church, within Vacaville, and in the larger world. And so there, you'll see there on screen, if you're watching at home or up behind me, if you're here in the room, there are some different ways to give. You can go online. Uh, there are two boxes uh, by each door on your way out if you want to uh, drop off a check, or you can always mail a check to the church. But let me take a moment and pray for our time of offering, uh, that God would use these offerings to, to bless his work. God, thank you for uh, the blessings that you give us. And uh, God, though we may work hard and uh, uh, make good decisions or sometimes not so good decisions, God, it is ultimately is you are the provider. You bless us. You give us what, it, what we have. And God, as, uh, as a showing of gratitude and of faithfulness, we give back a little bit of what you have given us so that it can be used for your work, God, both in this church here in Vacaville and in the world at large. God, we pray now for these tithes and offerings that uh, you would receive them, you would bless them, you would multiply them, and that they would uh, be used to uh, uh, further your word. And, and as Rodney preached about, God, it's all about bringing people to know Christ. And we pray that these offerings today further that goal. God, we love you, and we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's all stand. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Today, go and be a leader. Go talk to somebody about Christ and enjoy the day of independence. And all God's people said, amen. amen.
declare my destiny by your sky So I lay down my life And I lift up my eyes To Jesus, my future Your presence, my peace Beyond the horizon You're the hope that's in front of me Jesus, my fear Hear the sound of the wind Let the road 